Synchro Mystique presents The occult is a shadowy world. Historically, it has involved actors in sub-Rosa activities, prompted the adoption of pseudonyms, and, depending upon how unfavorably ruling powers would react to discovery, resulted in the creation of clandestine networks. All this is made to order for another area that might, at first glance, appear to be totally unrelated to these mystical or sorcerous undercurrents, namely the world of spycraft. But in fact, the two areas may overlap surprisingly frequently. In this video, we'll examine some of the junctures by looking primarily at 10 well-known occultists who have been accused of espionage. However, there is an almost unbelievably dramatic aspect to our entire saga. We will get to this in our final and climactic consideration of that much-honored American founding father who held a key to a kite string for a Luciferian personal lightning strike. Of course, we're referring to the man so well portrayed on the $100 bill and who needs no further introduction now. We'll start things off as we have done before with the man who styled himself the Great Beast 666, Edward Alexander Alistair Crowley. Perhaps no one has a higher profile in 20th century occultism than he. If the usual biographical sketches are credible, at one time or other Crowley dabbled in nearly every alternative form of religion and joined every esoteric group that existed. He had connections to both English and French Freemasonry. He was initiated into the magical system of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. He made a study of Theravada Buddhism and Tantra, and he became head of the Ordo Templi Orientis, or OTO. For more on some of these currents, see 10 Sex Magic Cults. When he was dissatisfied with the status quo, he either set about reforming pre-existing institutions in his own image, or simply formed his own. He started the AA, usually said to abbreviate the Latin phrase Argentium Astrum, or Silver Star, a magical society not to be confused with Alcoholics Anonymous, though at some point the latter organization may warrant a closer look. Crowley modified the high-grade Masonic degrees of John Yarker. He rewrote the rituals for the Gnostic Church and the OTO. Effectively, he established his own quasi-religion called Thelema. Not to be confused with the London-based hedge fund, Crowley's Thelema was based on precepts, such as do what thou wilt, that were articulated by the Renaissance writer Francois Rabelais. For more on the particulars of some of this, see our previous top 10 occultists of all time. But these interests placed Crowley in numerous out-of-the-way places on Earth, and he associated with many strange people. These facts, together with Crowley's own often exaggerated bravado, led to allegations that he was a spy. For example, for two years, Crowley worked as a columnist for German-born American political agitator and accused spy George Sylvester Fierek. In the lead-up to both world wars, Virek was outspokenly pro-German. He published two periodicals, The Fatherland and The International, for which Crowley both edited and wrote articles ostensibly championing Germany over against his native Britain. In his autobiography, Confessions, Crowley maintained that he had been doing undercover fact-finding for British intelligence. He also associated with one Gerald Hamilton, a man who, for a brief interval, was reputedly as notoriously wicked as Crowley. Also like Crowley, Hamilton seemed prone to aggrandize himself, so biographical details are a bit sketchy. But Hamilton appears occasionally to have operated as an information broker or a police informant. According to biographer Tobias Churton, Crowley met with one Guy Burgess in 1942. Burgess was a principal member of the ring of British double agents known as the Cambridge Five, under the direction of Harold Kim Philby, and from the era of World War II right through the early stages of the Cold War. The five spies secretly assisted the Soviet Union, to which Burgess defected in 1951. Crowley also had dealings, some of them potentially sexual in nature, with journalist and parliamentarian Thomas Tom Dryberg. Dryberg may, or may not, himself have worked with the Soviet KGB or the British MI5. In any case, he wrote a biography of Burgess. Finally, Crowley was acquainted with and influenced German-born doctor and occultist Arnold Krumheller. Krumheller was the neo-Gnostic founder of the South American-based Fraternitas Rosicruciana Antiqua, a blend of Martinism, Rosicrucianism, Spiritism, Thelema, and Theosophy. 
He was a personal physician to Francisco Madero, the 37th president of Mexico, until the latter's deposition and assassination in 1913. And of course, Krumheller was an operative in both the German and Mexican secret services. Krumheller appears to have reported to German diplomat and intelligence agent Felix Sommerfeld. The two may have been attempting to engineer a war between Mexico and the United States. To that end, Krumheller and Sommerfeld possibly instigated the bloody attack on Columbus, New Mexico by Mexican revolutionary Pancho Villa on March the 9th, 1916. During the 16th and 17th centuries, it was still uncommon for non-nobility to be widely traveled. Exceptions included certain craftsmen, for example stonemasons, as well as self-styled adventurers and occultists. On the other hand, you had noblemen who were themselves also esotericists. An obvious case is that of Michael Sendivogius. We covered Sendivogius in Top 10 Gold-Making Alchemists. Sendivogius shuttled among various European courts, including those of Emperors Rudolf II and Ferdinand II, and Polish King Sigismund III from the House of Vasa, for whom he was allegedly a double agent. Among other things, Sendivogius seems somehow to have been mixed up in the Russian affair of the false Dmitri during that country's so-called time of troubles. The gist was that a succession of various impostors, referred to as pseudo dmitris claimed to have been the youngest son of Tsar Ivan the Terrible, a son who was apparently assassinated at the age of eight. The first of these pretenders actually managed for a time to assume rulership of the country. Other European nations would give rise to interesting espionage occultism interrelations. And this brings us to Sweden and to the late 17th to early 18th century scientist turned philosopher theologian Emanuel Swedenborg. Initially, Swedenborg studied the physical sciences and became a knowledgeable mineralogist. His mechanical inventions, including one enabling ships to be transported on land, brought him to the attention and into the favor of government officials. Following a series of mystical experiences in the 1740s, Swedenborg devoted himself to spiritual pursuits. Essentially, he became convinced that he had a divine mission to reinterpret the Bible and Christianity effectively being the conduit for a new gospel. But he denied that he was acting on his own hook. Instead, Swedenborg claimed that he was merely delivering information obtained by visiting heaven and hell and conversing with angels and with God. Swedenborg was preoccupied with the hermetic notion of correspondence between human beings and the cosmos, an idea we sketched in the video 10 Arcane Words. Several of his doctrines arguably had a neo-Gnostic complexion. Some of them revolve around marital and even sexual concepts, as discussed in Top 10 Sex Magic Cults. For all that, the influence of his Protestant Lutheran background was still evident. After his death, a few of his disciples, referred to as Swedenborgians, founded the Church of the New Jerusalem, or the New Church. Swedenborgianism, in one form or other, attracted notables such as John Chapman, better known as Johnny Appleseed. Swedish entomologist Leonard Gyllenhaal, progenitor of actors Jake and Maggie Gyllenhaal, Henry James Sr., father of important writers Henry and William James, and popular Turkish-American health commentator Mehmet Genghis Oz, who is, in 2022, a senatorial candidate in Pennsylvania and who's known professionally as Dr. Oz. Swedenborg also inspired a group of French esoterics called the Illuminés of Avignon. This was an assembly of Freemasons led by Prussian King Frederick the Great's one-time librarian, Dom Antoine Joseph Pernetti, and a Polish count named Thaddeus Grabianka. The pair introduced the so-called Swedenborg Rite into their Masonic rituals. As to whether Swedenborg the man had himself been a member of the Brotherhood, the matter is hotly disputed. In her book, Emanuel Swedenborg, Secret Agent on Earth and in Heaven, author Marsha Keith Sukard has argued not only that Swedenborg was a Freemason, but also that he was a Jacobite spy in the employ of the Swedish government. According to her, Swedenborg was valued in part because of his access to secret Masonic networks, which functioned as confidential message relaying systems. Schuchard places Swedenborg, an inveterate traveler, at the epicenter of prominent British Prime Minister Robert Walpole's intelligence apparatus in Hanover, Germany. If true, this would place Swedenborg in a class of adventurers and businessmen operating during the heyday of mercantilism that also veered over into spycraft. This would include Swiss-English agent John Kustos and Prussian antiquarian Philippe von Stoch, 
both of whom were Freemasons. It also includes the even more mysterious Count of St. Germain, who was suspected of participating in Jacobite machinations during the 1740s. There is some evidence that St. Germain had worked for Frederick the Great as a secret diplomat, that is, a spy in France. Incidentally, the so-called Grand Constitutions of 1786 are one of the important traditional documents in the formation of the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. Those constitutions named the ubiquitous Frederick II as head of the Scottish Rite. Masonic orders play a recurring part in state intrigues. Recall that as part of the far-flung occult connections he maintained, Aleister Crowley was a high-degree Freemason. Even the Ordo Templi Orientis had originally been envisioned as a Masonic Academy. All this is suggestive, not to say instructive, not least because, as we have seen, several other historically important members of the craft also spent time as spies. For example, consider the case of Sir Robert Moray. Moray was on the ground floor of what is termed speculative masonry, as opposed to the operative variety in which bona fide builders and stoneworkers would have engaged. Although the official inception of the Grand Lodge of England wouldn't occur until June 24, 1717, Murray is recognized as having been among the men raised to masons as part of the first recorded initiation in England, circa 1641. Prior to that, Moray was part Part of a secretive coterie of Scottish military and statesmen who had some connection to France. Moray supposedly had close contact with the distinguished Duke Armand Jean du Plessis, better known as the Cardinal Richelieu. Richelieu was a shrewd political operator who managed to attain high offices in both the Catholic Church and in the government of France where he was King Louis XIII's chief minister. Among his accomplishments was that he catapulted France above Spain as the most powerful nation in continental Europe. He did this in part by negotiating tactical alliances with numerous Protestant countries, including the Dutch Republic, England, and Sweden, to oppose the Habsburgs who controlled both the Iberian Peninsula and the Holy Roman Empire. To advance this master plan, Richelieu maintained a network of spots, among whom was Sir Robert Moray. And among Moray's tasks seems to have been that of ingratiating himself with a militant group of lowland Presbyterian Scots called the Covenanters. Making short shrift of portions of Scottish history, we may summarize the situation. The Covenanters opposed King James VI, that is, James I of England, and his son, Charles I, at least insofar as these rulers followed the precedents set by King Henry VIII and assumed control of the church in Scotland. However, even though the Covenanters resented monarchical intrusions into church governance and theology, they recoiled in horror when Charles I was deposed and executed. So, the Covenanters extended an olive branch to Charles' son. Moray helped to persuade the Prince of Wales, the future Charles II, to visit Scotland for his coronation as King of Scots at Scone on the 1st of January, 1651. Charles II was reigning when a group of 12 men, including Robert Murray, met at Gresham College in 1660 and founded the Royal Society of London for improving natural knowledge. Murray was apparently instrumental in procuring the royal charter from the king. According to researcher Robert Lomas, all the key players were connected to Freemasonry. As discussed in the video Top 10 Gold-Making Alchemists, the Royal Society's initial membership included Sir Robert Boyle, the alchemist who helped launch the modern science of chemistry. In 1688, Boyle's advocacy helped persuade Parliament to overturn a law forbidding the practice of alchemy. This paved the road for the incorporation of the Bank of England just a few years later in 1694. For more context, see again Top 10 Gold-Making Alchemists of All Time. It's tempting to say that part of Sir Robert Moray's legacy was the London-based money power apparatus that, to a certain degree, supplanted the British monarchy starting in the 17th century. But Sir Moray was not the only Brother Mason to have entered into intelligence work. Another notable was the ponderously named individual, later known as the Chevalier d'Eon. We had occasion to name d'Eon in top 10 sex magic cults. Owing to his alleged affiliation with English poet and Emanuel Swedenborg disciple William Blake, in that place we noted the Chevalier's reputation as a cross-dresser, an unusual pastime for an 18th century gentleman. It turns out, however, that this fact, irrespective of its possible sexual connotations and implications, figures in at least one persistent tale of international intrigue. According to the story recounted in the Chevalier's memoirs, the French king, Louis XV, wished to open a secret channel of communication with Elizabeth Romanov, then the Empress of Russia. The trouble, according to D'Eon, was that England was using its influence to prevent French emissaries, on pain of death, 
from entering Russia. In order to circumvent English security, the Chevalier de Ea claimed that he impersonated a woman and inveigled himself into service as a maid of honor to the Empress. De Ea was closely aligned with the House de Broglie, which eventually produced famed quantum physicist Louis de Broglie, who postulated the particle wave duality of subatomic particles, like electrons. For example, de Ea and Charles Francois de Broglie were both operatives in Louis XV's clandestine King's Secret group. Among other things, the Marquis worked with playwright and spy Pierre Beaumarchais, composer of The Barber of Seville and The Marriage of Figaro. Together, de Broglie and Beaumarchais lobbied the French government in support of the American cause of revolution. We'll return to this time period shortly. For now, we'll register the fact that the duo was instrumental in convincing fellow Freemason Gilbert du Motier, famously known as the Marquis de Lafayette, to intervene on behalf of the Americans. Fast forwarding to more recent intrigues, we note the late 19th to early 20th century Russian painter and occultist Nicholas Rorick. He achieved early public acclaim for his symbolist oil compositions, as well as for stage costume designs. For example, in Igor Stravinsky's 1913, the Rite of Spring. Like Aleister Crowley, Rorick and his wife Helena became students of multiple spiritual traditions, including Buddhism, Hinduism, mythology, and theosophy, which of course owed its formulation in large measure to another Russian esoteric, H.P. Blavatsky. Incidentally, Blavatsky's Australian critic Richard Hodgson once accused her of being a spy herself. Similarly to Blavatsky, the Roricks claimed to be in contact with Himalayan-based Ascended Masters. These Mahatmas prompted them to create their own mystical system, known as Anya Yoga. In turn, the Roricks' innovations have fed New Age and transhumanist currents. Eventually, the pair traveled to the United States. In America, the Roricks impressed Freemason and financier Louis L. Horch, who, in 1928, paid for the construction of the original Rorick Museum at the Master Building in New York City. Among those who frequented the Master Building was Freemasonic philosopher Manley Palmer Hall. For his part, Nicholas Rorick became a spiritual advisor to politician Henry A. Wallace. At the time, Wallace served as President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's Secretary of Agriculture, but he would shortly become FDR's third-term vice president. Had he not been edged out by Harry S. Truman during the 1944 election cycle, Wallace might have become President of the United States when FDR died in office in 1945. Because of his contacts, history, and mobility, Rorick was commissioned by Wallace to search Southeast Asia in search of drought-resistant grass to offset the negative effects of the Dust Bowl. But what he may really have been doing was attempting to secure local support for an Asian Union, possibly around Eastern Messianic expectations. Rorick is now counted among the ranks of that motley assortment of characters who took up the reins of what has been called the Great Game after the British Empire went into eclipse. The phrase, the Great Game, a 19th century coinage, was popularized by Freemason and novelist Rudyard Kipling, especially in his 1901 classic, Kim. The degree to which masonry interconnected with political intrigue was vividly, if fancifully, showcased in Kipling's 1888 short story, The Man Who Would Be King, which was adapted for film in 1975 by John Huston and featured actors Michael Caine, Sean Connery, and Christopher Plummer. Also termed the Tournament of Shadows, the overarching power struggle between the British and Russian empires revolved around the geopolitical significance of portions of Asia, including Afghanistan, India, and Tibet. To many theorists, this is the heartland of the world, and it is riddled with symbolism. Pursuant to his mythological interests, Rorik also appears to have been on the hunt for legendary locations supposedly imbued with magical powers. For one thing, beneath the surface of Tibet, quite literally, was said to lie the mythical subterranean city of Agartha, supposed home to the Lord of the World. Or again, the hidden paradise called Shambhala has long been rumored to be in the vicinity. Some claim that it is an undiscovered city somewhere in the Himalayas, in northern Tibet. Others, including Rorik, seem to have searched for it in the Altai Mountains, in an area sometimes referred to as the Russian Tibet. Interestingly, FDR wasn't the only world leader to fix his attentions on Tibet. Under Soviet chairman Vladimir Lenin, the cryptographer, spy, and tantric Buddhist Gleb Ivanovich Bokia also attempted to locate Shambhala. One of Bokia's stated aims was to merge the sex-magical-oriented Kala Chakra Tantra 
with ideas of communism. For more on Tantra, see 10 Sex Magic Cults. If the mingling of these ideologies seems incredible, recall that after the October Revolution of 1917, high-ranking women in the Communist Party advocated free love as a government policy, hoping to achieve the destruction of bourgeois institutions such as monogamy and the nuclear family. One such advocate was Marxist feminist theorist Alexandra Kolontai, who compared the satisfaction of sexual urges to the slaking of appetites such as hunger and thirst. Thus, until his summary execution during Joseph Stalin's Great Purge, Bokia's orchestration of and participation in sex orgies was apparently not viewed as incongruous with his activity in the various organs of the Soviet intelligence apparatus. In the decade following Bokia's search for Shambhala, then-German Führer Adolf Hitler sent his own exploratory party to the Tibetan region under zoologist and German Secret Service agent Ernst Schaefer. The expedition was operated under the auspices of SS Reichsfuhrer Heinrich Himmler's Anna Nerva, which basically investigated what might be termed esoteric genealogy. The explorers supposedly sought to establish that Tibet was the cradle of the Aryan race. Also operating in the Indian subcontinent around the same time was the eccentric, French-born Greek occultist Maximiana Julia Portas. Portas converted to Hinduism and changed her name to Savitri Devi. Her Hindu sympathies stemmed from an interpretation of the history and etymology of the word Aryan. Oh, and she was also a spy. Stationed in India, Devi socialized with and reported on Anglo-American diplomats and officers. Another interesting contemporary was John Godolphin Bennett. J.G. Bennett was apparently a linguistic savant who was connected in some fashion to British intelligence. After mastering Turkish, he was stationed in Constantinople, or Istanbul, toward the tail end of World War I. Perhaps significantly, later American Central Intelligence Chief Alan Dulles was also in the same vicinity. In 1916, Dulles joined the U.S. Foreign Service. He was assigned to Constantinople, or Istanbul, from October of 1920 to 1922, and then he went to Washington, D.C. to become the State Department specialist on the Near East. Like with Dulles's experience, Bennett's time in Turkey resulted in his promotion. He was recruited to be the head of Military Intelligence B Division with responsibility for the entire Middle Eastern region. Following the European War and the Bolshevik Revolution, Bennett was assigned to surveil Russian emigres and expatriates. This put him in contact with occultist G.I. Gurdjieff and with Gurdjieff's principal disciple, P.D. Uspensky. Gurdjieff's influence has been considerable. For example, the previously mentioned Bokia, on the eve of his execution, confessed that he and Nicholas Rorick had been part of a secret society dedicated to Armenian mystic George Gurdjieff. On the contemporary scene, Take Ulrich Leonard Turle, better known as Eckhart Tolle, or Tall. Tolle is promoted as a spiritual teacher by talk show guru Oprah Winfrey, among many others. Tolle, in turn, acknowledges his conceptual debt to Gurdjieff, and one of Gurdjieff's earliest European champions was the British intelligence agent Bennett. These associations, and an alleged near-death, out-of-body experience, warmed Bennett up to all things esoteric. Besides Gurdjieff's so-called fourth way, Bennett ended up delving into Rudolf Steiner's Anthroposophy, H.P. Blavatsky's Theosophy, and later, along with 20th century Sufi writer Idris Shah, he helped popularize Islamic mysticism in Britain. Along with Carl Kellner, Theodore Royce was one of the initial founders of the Ordo Templi Orientis or OTO. We mentioned this organization in connection with Crowley, who ratcheted its sex obsessions into the stratosphere. For some of the lurid details, see Top 10 Sex Magic Cults. But beyond their common interest in Magia Sexualis and Tantra, Crowley and Royce shared another thing in common, supposed ties to intelligence work. In the case of Royce, this amounted to alleged involvement with the Prussian secret police. Specifically, Royce was accused by 19th century British socialist William Morris. In an article titled Police Spy exposed, Morris wrote that one, quote, Charles Theodore Royce, formerly theatrical impresario and concert singer, is now Prussian statesman Otto von Bismarck's political agent. As writer and former Blondie drummer Gary Lackman notes, this put Royce in the orbit of anarchists and socialists. In fact, Royce was expelled from the English Socialist League for spying on Karl Marx's daughter Eleanor for the Germans. Bear in mind, 
that an agent of the Prussian secret police is frequently identified by contemporary writers as having been the motivating force behind the infamous document known as the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. Almost universally and variously denounced as a forgery or a hoax, the Protocols is part of a spate of 19th century socio-politically supercharged manuscripts with questionable provenances. We hope to be able to enumerate 10 of the most salient of these in a future video. For the time being, we observe that the nexus of intelligence with quasi-religious texts is not confined to bygone times. Consider as just a single example the ponderous tome titled A Course in Miracles. After the works of Alice Bailey and Edgar Cayce, the writings of Marilyn Ferguson and James Redfield, and alongside other supposedly channeled treatises, such as those of Jay-Z Knight and Dorothy Jane Roberts, A Course in Miracles has been hugely influential for New Agers. The Course contains material allegedly channeled by a psychologist named Helen Shuckman from an entity that she elsewhere supposedly identified as Jesus. However, Shuckman merely dictated the words of a perceived inner voice to at least one other collaborator. According to the story, this person was her colleague, William Newton Thetford, and this is where things take a strange turn. For consulting Thetford's autobiographical sketch, as presented on A Course in Miracles website, we find that he was trained by Carl Rogers at the University of Chicago. It is a little-known fact that the much-esteemed Rogers was a board member for the Central Intelligence Agency-connected Human Ecology Fund, which appears to have been an MKUltra cover operation. MKUltra, you'll recall, was the CIA's illegal brainwashing program. The Cornell University-based Human Ecology Fund was also an institutional home for Louis Jolion West. Dr. West engaged in public shadow boxing with L. Ron Hubbard's Church of Scientology. He was consulted as a brainwashing expert in the trial of Patricia Campbell Hurst, better known as Patty Hurst. She is the granddaughter of publishing tycoon William Randolph Hearst, and she became notorious when she was arrested for numerous crimes, including bank robberies, committed in connection with a strange leftist terrorist organization called the Symbionese Liberation Army. Dr. West assisted Hearst's defense team which claimed that she had been mind-controlled through rape and other forms of coercion. Not only this, but Dr. Jolly West had been called in to evaluate small-time mobster Jack Ruby. After Ruby murdered accused JFK assassin Lee Harvey Oswald on live television. But back to Thetford. The psychologist further disclosed that he himself was recruited into the CIA during the 1950s. According to Thetford's account, the CIA, under John W. Gittinger, was expanding a battery of personality assessments that had originally been conceived by Harvard University professor Henry Murray. Murray is notorious for conducting a series of barbaric human experiments on Harvard students, including on the now infamous so-called Unabomber Theodore Ted Kaczynski. During Murray's research project, an untold number of individuals were given mind-altering drugs, including LSD or lysergic acid diethylamide, as well as psilocybin. Others were essentially emotionally traumatized. In other words, it was mind control experimentation. According to an article in Psychology Today, Murray seems to have been the one who first turned psychedelic drug advocate Timothy Leary on to LSD. As a final point in this tangled web, Helen Shuckman herself, along with Thetford, was the recipient of at least one indirect research grant from the Central Intelligence Agency. This means that both key players involved in the publication of A Course in Miracles were, at least at one time, working under the auspices of the MKUltra mind control program. Oh, recall Helen Shuckman's claim to have heard a disembodied voice in her head? It is interesting to consider this alongside a further datum known as the microwave auditory effect, whereby communications are generated directly inside the human head without the need of any receiving electronic device. This was discovered in the early 1960s by biologist Alan H. Frey. At the time, Frey published a paper on the phenomenon, now sometimes called the Frey Effect. He was employed by General Electric's Advanced Electronic Center. Would you be surprised if I told you that the Advanced Electronic Center was supposedly associated with the MK Ultra connected Cornell University in Ithaca, New York? To summarize, we have an ostensible CIA operative named William N. Thetford, who, by his own testimony, was a participant in MK Ultra psychological experiments. He's working closely with a fellow MKUltra grant recipient to record, edit, and publicize what would, partially through the promotion of system-approved media gurus like 
Oprah Winfrey, become a hugely influential text of New Age spirituality. And this text was allegedly obtained through a process oddly reminiscent of the Frey Effect, a radar-induced sensation of inner communication that had just been identified prior to Helen Shuckman's adventures in inner dictation. Did I miss anything? While you ponder that, I'll note that the case is hardly the only curious interstice between intelligence and contemporary culture. As mentioned before on this channel, consider in this vein a man who may have considered the fictional Marvel Comics character Howard Stark, father of Tony Stark, billionaire playboy and tech savant, and the real-life identity for the superhero known as Iron Man. Of course, I have in mind the American California Institute of Technology Associated rocket scientist John Whiteside Parsons, better known as Jack. Given his possible inspirational role for the movie representation of Howard Stark, I'm sure it's just an extraordinary coinkydink that his given name at birth was Marvel. He was also a principal member and later head of the so-called Agape Lodge, a United States branch of Aleister Crowley's Ordo Templi Orientis. By day, he made numerous discoveries pertinent to the manufacture of both liquid-fueled and solid-state aeronautical engines. Parsons was one of the founders of Caltech's Jet Propulsion Lab. One important series of test explosions was fired off on Halloween, no less, in 1936. The event, which was photographed for posterity, is known as the Nativity and is annually recreated in memoriam. Many of Parsons' engineering projects were conducted under the directorship of Hungarian-born American mathematician and physicist Theodor von Karman. According to an article published by Britain's August Royal Society, which we mentioned throughout top 10 gold-making alchemists, the most famous of von Karman's ancestors is Rabbi Judah Lowe, the exalted rabbi of Prague, a famous 16th century scholar who is credited by legend with the creation of the Golem of Prague. By night, Parsons accentuated these tantalizing biographical details by performing sex magical rituals, some of which were aimed at summoning elemental spirits. The culmination of his efforts was the Babylon working, the stated goal of which was the incarnation of a quasi-demonic being on Earth. For more on this aspect of Parsons' life, see our video, Top 10 Sex Magic Cults. Eventually, and perhaps inevitably, Parsons' path crossed with Hughes Aircraft Company, originally founded by eccentric engineer and entrepreneur Howard Hughes. Parsons obtained a Hughes chemical manufacturing contract. While under Hughes's employ, he was accused of document theft. This led to charges of corporate espionage and allegations that he was spying for the newly created nation of Israel. To complicate matters, Parsons was for a time romantically involved with one Sarah Northrup. Sarah was the sister of Parsons' first wife, Helen Northrup. Sarah eventually broke things off with Jack and eloped with his then fellow Thelemite and later Church of Scientology founder, Lafayette Ronald Hubbard, better known as L. Ron Hubbard. As if the love triangles weren't bewildering enough, a tapestry of espionage intrigue was superimposed on the situation. Firstly, Hubbard denounced Sarah as a, quote, Nazi spy. Though Hubbard's allegations have been largely dismissed and appear to have been rejected by Federal Bureau of Investigation agents as sour grapes. Secondly, Hubbard himself was connected to naval intelligence. He would later claim that his membership, along with Parsons and Northrop, in the Agape Lodge had merely been part of a covert sting operation geared toward eradicating black magic cults in California. Although officially exonerated of wrongdoing himself, Parson's reputation and acquaintances resulted in the permanent revocation of his all-important security clearances. He was compelled to ancillary fields, such as pyrotechnics, to continue exercising his peculiar skill sets. Ultimately, Parsons lost his life conducting some obviously perilous experiment inside of his home. Explanations ranged from the pedestrian, such as hastiness due to the pressures of meeting a shipping demand for an order of fireworks from a Hollywood movie studio, to the exotic, such as the speculation that Parsons was attempting to animate a Frankenstein-like creature called a homunculus. For more on that, see 10 Sex Magic Cults. Of course, there were also those who believed Parsons had been murdered. Hypotheses included that there was some anti-Zionist conspiracy motivated by Parsons' cooperation with Israel, that various industrial tycoons, including Hughes, might have been looking to rid themselves of their competition, or even that the Los Angeles Police Department may have sought vengeance for Parsons' role in the conviction of Captain Earl E. Kynet. Kynet had been charged with conspiracy in an attempted car bombing directed against a former detective Harry J. Redman, who had blown the whistle on law enforcement corruption. The subplot thickens, as it were, when one discovers that Captain Kynan didn't simply preside over beat cops. He was the head of the LAPD's intelligence unit. He and his officers were themselves referred to in the press as police spies.
John Dee, the Elizabethan sorcerer that we introduced in our video, Top 10 Occultists, already had a reputation as a skilled astrologer, cartographer, and mathematician when he acquired a curious book that may have assisted or even inspired him in a more covert path. The book, titled Steganographia, had been written circa 1500 by the mysterious Benedictine monk Johannes Trithemius. The contents and significance of the book are still being debated some 500 years later, but it's clear that it uses ostensibly magical emblems and formulae to convey groundbreaking techniques in cryptography. In fact, the word steganography, albeit uncommon in conversation around the water cooler, has entered English, where it refers to the practice of concealing messages or information within other non-secret text or data. And this appears to be precisely how John Dee applied the procedure. 17th century English polymath Robert Hooke, writing at the turn of the 18th century, suggested in the chapter of Dr. Dee's Book of Spirits that John Dee had made use of Trithemian steganography to conceal his communications with Queen Elizabeth I. In this way, Dee, if I may be forgiven the expression, took a page out of the book of yet another Renaissance Magus who had been influenced by Trithemius, the German polymath Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa. Like Dee, whom he inspired, Agrippa was fascinated by codes and by all things esoteric, on which he wrote the seminal three books of occult philosophy. And like his later English counterpart, Dee, Agrippa also seems to have been connected to the world of espionage and may have functioned as a diplomatic spy for Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian I. Likewise, Dee seems to have at one time operated as an intelligencer for the English crown. Reportedly, when Sir Francis Walsingham was appointed chief spy by Queen Elizabeth, the role for which he is principally remembered, he found it necessary to consult with the only man in England who understood encryption ciphers and who, legend had it, had long since served as the Queen's spy, John Dee. According to researcher Richard Deacon, there is an idea of Dee as a roving James Bond of Tudor times, which, though it is far-fetched in certain respects, for example, Dee was certainly not regarded as a ladies' man, nevertheless has a basis in fact and history. For example, and remarkably according to Deacon, whose real name was Donald McCormick, 20th century author Ian Fleming unconsciously borrowed as a code name for his hero, the very signature used by Bond's Elizabethan counterpart, 007. Though Deacon admits that overall, despite his signature, Deacon better be compared to Admiral Sir Reginald Hall, Director of Naval Intelligence in World War I, rather than to James Bond. Unlike Bond, he was not directly involved in the maritime defense of the nation, but he was able to lend his technical and navigational know-how to sailors at the court of Elizabeth. To extend the analogy to Ian Fleming-inspired characters, maybe he was a little more like Q than Bond. We might as well continue this Elizabethan saga by speaking of the courtier to whom, according to Masonic philosopher Manley Palmer Hall, John Dee might have passed his torch of occult knowledge. Francis Bacon was a late 16th to early 17th century English lawyer, philosopher, and politician. Intellectually, he was a trailblazing British empiricist. He articulated a method of reasoning that is still referred to as Baconian induction, and was a forerunner of what evolved into the scientific method. At his high point under King James I, Bacon became Lord High Chancellor, but his career as a member of the court ended on a sour note. Bacon's longtime enemy, the famed jurist Sir Edward Coke, brought numerous corruption charges against him, including that he accepted bribes. Beyond his duties as as a statesman, and seemingly apart from his role in the development of experimental science, Bacon may also have been an esoteric adept. Freemasonic writer Manley Hall possibly drawing upon a tradition that was transmitted to him via Max Heindel's Rosicrucian Fellowship represents Bacon as the inheritor of an occult gnosis that was transmitted to him by John Dee. This is a story for another time, but what is interesting from the standpoint of the current topic is that the Lord Bacon's younger brother, Anthony, was undeniably a member of the Elizabethan-era spy network headed by the previously mentioned Sir Francis Walsingham. The Bacon family was a powerful force in England at the time, and it raises the question of how much sharing of information 
and vision might have occurred between the brothers. In this respect, the Bacon family bears some similarity to the Dulles family. In 20th century America, of course, Alan Welsh Dulles, having been instrumental in the wartime Office of Strategic Services and its successor, the Central Intelligence Agency, was indisputably one of the United States' highest-ranking spies. At the same time, his older brother, John Foster Dulles, was an attorney and a high-level political insider. He was the Secretary of State under President Dwight D. Eisenhower, worked closely with Republican Party boss Thomas E. Dewey, and was a key player in the United States' early participation in the United Nations. The Dulles brothers coordinated in at least two covert operations, both considered by Masonic President Harry S. Truman, but ultimately authorized and implemented by President Dwight D. Eisenhower. The first was Operation Ajax, by which the CIA and Britain's MI6 in 1953, overthrew the democratically elected Iranian leader Mohammad Mossadegh and installed the Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi in his place. The second was Operation PB Success, which the following year ousted democratically elected Guatemalan President Jacobo Arbenz and installed a military junta. Speaking of coups and rebellions, and as we teased in our introduction, we would be remiss if we didn't say something about one of America's homegrown revolutionaries. And that brings us at last to number one. Benjamin Franklin, of course, was an 18th century polymath who is most famous for his role in securing the United States as its own nation, independent of England. As one of the country's preeminent statesmen, he was co-signer for each of three uber-important formative documents, the Declaration of Independence, the U.S. Constitution, and the Treaty of Paris. It's worth mentioning that Franklin arguably displays numerous similarities to Francis Bacon. For example, along with his Italian contemporary Galileo, Bacon is regarded as a father of modern experimental science. Similarly, having made contributions to the studies of electricity and oceanography, Benjamin Franklin was also at the forefront of investigation during his era. Several of his inventions, including bifocal lenses and the lightning rod, are still in use. Moreover, according to Baconian legend, the man known variously as Lord Verulam and the Viscount St. Alban figures in Rosicrucianism and the beginning of Freemasonry. Likewise, Franklin not only became a Mason, but he was elevated to the position of master at lodges both in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, as well as in Paris, France. There, in the Lodge of the Nine Sisters, which coincidentally or not, later became an important center for the bloody French Revolution, Franklin was initiated by the Cour de Jabalin, fountainhead of Western occult fascination with the tarot deck. Franklin later personally initiated François-Marie Arouet, better known as the satirist Voltaire. In truth, Freemasonry may just have been the tip of the iceberg of Franklin's occult involvement, though a word of caution is in order. The word occult has a range of meanings. We discussed some of these in 10 arcane words. For a more detailed survey, see that presentation. But somewhere along the occult spectrum lies the Bavarian Illuminati, to which Franklin can be connected through pamphleteer Thomas Paine. Paine was on intimate terms with one Nicholas Bonneville, and incidentally with Bonneville's wife. Prior to the order's official dissolution in 1787, Bonneville had been converted to Illuminism by Adam Weishaupt's chief lieutenant, Christian Boda. At the same time, allegedly, the seeming sober-minded politician and printer, Franklin, was himself a member of the quasi-satanic group known colloquially as the Hellfire Club. Technically, the order to which Franklin is said to have belonged alternately called itself the Brotherhood or Knights of St. Francis of Wickham and the Monks of Medmenham, both phrases intended as parodies of Christian, especially Catholic, religiosity. But the label Hellfire Club is the one that is stuck. It turns out that there was a predecessor club by the exact name. This original incarnation goes back to a curious 18th century English duke and playboy named Philip Wharton. At various times, the paradoxical Wharton hosed as both friend and enemy of Freemasonry. This flip-flopping on Freemasonry is somewhat reminiscent of the later Frenchman who called himself Leo Taxel. For details, see Top 10 Gold-Making Alchemists of All Time. Supposedly, Wharton once presided over the premier Grand Lodge of England, as well as of the Grand Loge de France. However, after his alleged expulsion, he found an even more secret society. Wharton ran this supposedly anti-Masonic organization called the Gormagons, along with Andrew Michael Ramsey, a Scotsman known by the French title Chevalier, that is, Knight. In a famous speech delivered in 1736, Ramsey connected Freemasonry to a group of Catholic crusaders. Later typically identified as the Knights Templar, 
The military order to which Ramsey referred was said to have passed its mysteries on to those men who founded Masonry. This idea, called Templarism, is detectable in esoteric degrees of appendant societies, such as of the York Rite, which offers a set of Knights Templar degrees. But even within the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite, which, in an apparent nod to our Scottish Chevalier Ramsay, is sometimes designated by the French word Ecossais, one finds shades of Templarism, for example, in the so-called Knight Rose Croix. Politically, Ramsey was also a Jacobite. This group, whose name comes from the Latin Jacobus, derived from King James II, the Catholic King of England who was deposed by Parliament during the Glorious Revolution and replaced by the Protestant William of Orange. There has long been speculation that certain Jacobites, like the Chevalier Ramsey, with the possible assistance of French Jesuits, attempted to rewrite various Masonic rituals. Their presumed intention was to introduce these reformulations back to England to increase public support for the ousted House of Stuart and possibly for Catholicism. At least this line, that Freemasonry had been co-opted by agents within the Vatican's militant Society of Jesus, was pushed by the likes of Boda, Bonneville, and Weishaupt. These men build the Illuminati as the antidote. Its anti-authoritarianism was pro-revolution and equally opposed to kings, and popes. Philip Wharton himself had Jacobite sympathies for much of his life, and Wharton was friends with James II's son, James Francis Edward Stuart, known variously as the Old Pretender or as the rightful King James III, depending on the side one favored. Late in his short life, Wharton seems to have abandoned the Jacobite cause and, like Emanuel Swedenborg, may have been a spy for English Prime Minister Robert Walpole. Walpole was a stalwart advocate for the Georgian kings of the German House of Hanover, and he employed numerous covert agents, including the ostensible anti-Jacobite George Doddington. Supposedly, George Doddington also happened to be a member of English politician Sir Francis Dashwood's circle. When Dashwood rebooted Wharton's Hellfire Club, beginning at London's George and Vulture Tower, Doddington reportedly signed up, along with other influential persons, including Benjamin Franklin. This is interesting for many reasons, not least of which is writer Richard Deacon's contention that the club served as a cover for British intelligence, and in effect became a center of English espionage. And Benjamin Franklin was right in the thick of things. In fact, according to one researcher, Franklin came to England in 1758 expressly to discuss the future of the American colonies with Dashwood. Additionally, Franklin had close dealings in Paris with Edward Bancroft, who was later unmasked as a double agent. It is disputed whether Franklin knew of Bancroft's intrigues or not. As if that weren't enough, Franklin appears to have known and corresponded with the Chevalier de Eon, who we covered earlier. According to Deacon, the Philadelphia philosopher and the Chevalier became friendly in the 1770s when the French master spy was assigned to London and promptly joined the Hellfire Club. All this doesn't necessarily mean that Franklin was a spy himself, that he had treasonous designs, or that he was working for the British. Though historian Cecil B. Curry raises this precise possibility in his 1972 study, Code Number 72, Ben Franklin patriot, or spy. Admittedly, Franklin was cunning. It could be that he was hedging his bets if the colonists were defeated. Alternately, Franklin may have been conspiring with a group of supporters inside George III's own government. In this regard, it is worth recalling that Freemasonry extended throughout Britain and its colonies. American lodges frequently obtained their charters, that is, their authority to operate, from the Grand Lodge of England, so that there existed some transatlantic supranational confederation is not outside the realm of possibility. One does wonder, however, just what Franklin was doing cavorting with the Hellfire group, if not simply using their meeting place as a convenient locale for hatching political schemes. It should be remembered that Franklin was something of a ladies' man. He himself, in his autobiography, admitted his weakness for the opposite sex, writing that he was, quote, hurried frequently into intrigues with low women that fell in his way. Of course, the received and sanitized view of the Hellfire Club is that it was characterized by ritual comedy, banqueting, drinking, and wenching. Though to read Daniel Mannix's account, the Black Mass was celebrated and a solemn sacrifice was made to the devil of the virginity of the young girls lured into the cave system a reference to the series of chalk caves 
directly beneath St. Lawrence Church in West Wickham, Southeast England, where Dashwood hosted Hellfire Revels. This darker complexion to the story might be dismissed as so much scandal-mongering against the esteemed author of Poor Richard's Almanac, were it not for an odd discovery made in 1998 by workmen renovating Franklin's old digs at number 36 Craven Street in London. Over 1,200 pieces of human bone were retrieved from a one-meter-wide, one-meter-deep pit. One of the builders who made the grisly discovery exclaimed, it was like a horror movie. According to the London Times, most of the bones showed signs of having been dissected, sawn, or cut. One of the skulls had been drilled with several holes. At the time, Paul Knappman, the Westminster coroner, said in an official statement, quote, I cannot totally discount the possibility of a crime. However, this angle was never investigated. According to the Benjamin Franklin House website, since it was determined that the bones were more than 100 years old, an inquest was not required. Instead, it is casually asserted that the bones are the remnants of an anatomy school run from the house by one William Hewson, son-in-law of Franklin's landlady, Margaret Stevenson. Even if this nonchalant reply is accepted at face value, one might worry that it glosses over several important points. For instance, there's the issue of just where the bodies were obtained. The further worry about why the remains of fellow human beings were so callously discarded is usually answered with the observation that the basement pit was probably used to, quote, hide the bones because grave robbing was illegal. But this solves nothing, unless that is learning about a founding father's complicity in criminal grave robbery and evidence tampering is only worth an insouciant shrug. That Hewson lived at the house for two years is mentioned in the usual retelling. But why Franklin shared quarters with him is evidently a question that is not interesting enough to answer. Likewise, the obvious follow-up query, namely, why Franklin would permit his home to be converted into a makeshift, quote, anatomy school, is apparently also of little to no consequence. While one wrestles with these lacunae, commentators on the Craven Street bones are busying themselves displaying an inexplicable omniscience, in virtue of their typically solemn assurances that our American hero had nothing to do with the unsanctioned surgeries themselves, perish the thought. Though how Franklin's aloofness and innocence could be ascertained without an investigation is anyone's guess. Doubtless it is an inference from axioms such as that he that would live in peace and at ease must not speak all he knows or judge all he sees. Nevertheless, on pain of being labeled gadflies, we must press this inquiry a bit further. After all, William Hewson was said to have been trained by anatomist William Hunter. In an article published in 2010 by the Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine, one may read a prima facie case that Hunter along with accomplice William Smelly, were responsible for a series of 18th century murders of pregnant women with a death total greater than the combined murders committed by the famous 19th century murderers Burke and Hare and Jack the Ripper. Not only this, but as mentioned in top 10 gold-making alchemists of all time, Freemasonic reference materials ritualize the word autopsy. This implies that in a bizarre and arguably twisted way, some Masons, perhaps like Franklin, may view the procedure of an autopsy both medically and esoterically. But surely there's nothing to see here. Lest viewers conclude that these odd and frankly alarming connections are relics of the past, we have only to ponder the career of New World Order booster George Herbert Walker Bush. Bush had moved in upper-level political orbits since at least the early 1950s, when he worked to support the presidential campaign of Dwight D. Eisenhower. But he was introduced in earnest into federal positions by Richard M. Nixon, who appointed him the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations and Chair of the Republican National Committee. Coincidentally or not, Bush's tenure corresponded to revelations about a sensational and apparently bungled burglary attempt, and its ensuing cover-up at the RNC's counterpart Democratic National Committee's headquarters at the Watergate complex in Washington, D.C. The whole sordid business involved key personnel in Nixon's White House and resulted in the president's unprecedented resignation in 1974. Reportedly, Bush's profile was high enough throughout this period that he was considered for the vice presidency by both Nixon and Gerald R. Ford. It's well known that Bush eventually did become the vice president under Ronald Reagan, and and he very nearly became president on March the 30th, 1981, when a would-be assassin's bullets crippled White House Press Secretary James Brady 
and nearly claimed Reagan's life. It's less well known that the Bushes had ties to the family of accused shooter John Hinckley Jr. According to a New York Times article dated April Fool's Day 1981, the eldest Hinckley child, Scott, is a friend of Neil Bush the son of Vice President Bush. In fact, Neil Bush and Scott Hinckley were such close friends that the two had planned to attend a dinner together at the young Bush's home, but we're told the dinner was canceled after the shooting. The elder Bush, who would in 1989 succeed Ronald Reagan and become the 41st President of the United States, had been tapped in 1976 by then-President Gerald Ford to assume headship of the Central Intelligence Agency. You'll recall that Gerald Rudolph Ford, whose birth name had been Leslie Lynch King Jr., had also been a member of the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy, better known as the Warren Commission. Interestingly, although Bush denied having had any intelligence experience prior to his becoming chief spook, a provocative memo from longtime Federal Bureau of Investigation Director J. Edgar Hoover suggests otherwise. Hoover reported that on the day after JFK's murder, the Bureau had provided two individuals with briefings. One was Captain William Edwards of the Defense Intelligence Agency. The other, Mr. George Bush of the Central Intelligence Agency. It's probably not worth mentioning that just a year prior to Bush's appointment as DCI, Ford was himself the target of two assassination attempts just a few weeks apart. The first, on September the 5th, 1975, involved Manson family member Lynette Squeaky Fromm and occurred in Sacramento, California. We mentioned Charles Manson in Top 10 Sex Magic Cults. The second assassination attempt, September the 22nd, 1975, took place in San Francisco, in front of the St. Francis Hotel. This public attention on the name St. Francis reminded synchromistic extraordinaire James Shelby Downard of the Hellfire Club, which, as we discussed, jokingly called its members Monks of St. Francis. One Sarah Jane Kahn, alias Sarah Jane Moore, was arrested and served 32 years for the second criminal attempt on Ford's life. At one point, Moore had been an informant for the Federal Bureau of Investigation. She also had peculiar ties to Randolph Hearst's organization, People in Need, and by extension to the Patty Hearst case mentioned earlier. To make matters stranger, Time Magazine reported that Moore had made national headlines in the early 1950s by collapsing in front of the White House, suffering from amnesia. That's probably not worth looking into. Nor, I suppose, is it newsworthy that the young Sarah Jane and a youthful Charlie Manson for a time supposedly lived in the same neighborhood. These are obviously meaningless bits of trivia, like the fact that George Herbert Walker Bush was close to so many high-level political killings or attempts. What would this country have done without him? Oh, I got so carried away with the intel connections I almost forgot to mention the occult angle. Along with his son and 43rd President George Walker, as well as with numerous other policy-making heavy hitters, like W's opponent in the 2004 presidential election, John Forbes Carey, George Herbert Walker Bush was a member of the ultra-exclusive and spookily named Secret Society Skull and Bones operating at Yale University. They meet in a walled-off, crypt-looking building affectionately referred to as the Tomb. Supposedly, the Bonesmen have a collection of human skulls, including those previously resting on the shoulders of famous Apache elder Geronimo, as well as of the previously mentioned Mexican revolutionary-born Jose Doroteo Arango, but better known as Pancho Villa. But that establishment recruitment mechanism, which masquerades as a college fraternity, will have to be the subject of a future study. Reportedly, the elder George Bush was also a member of the Bohemian Grove. This exclusive retreat for corporate moguls, Hollywood celebrities, and political VIPs is located in an old-growth redwood forest a few miles northwest of San Francisco in Sonoma County, California. When participants aren't enlarging one another's social networks or brainstorming ways to enhance each other's careers, they're apparently gallivanting in the groves reenacting pagan religious ceremonies. One such rite, referred to as the cremation of care, is outwardly an entreaty for guests to leave their troubles at the proverbial door before a week of rest and relaxation. Esoterically, 
the ritual, which perhaps inspired by Benjamin Franklin arcana, is said to involve a supposedly mock human sacrifice, could instead be understood to represent the searing of conscience, supposedly necessary, to authorize such barbaric things as assassinations, enhanced interrogations, extraordinary renditions, and other incivilities without a hint of remorse. If you found something of interest in this presentation, please like the video. If you would care to see additional content, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. If you would like to support efforts to create additional penetrating materials, then your one-time super like or ongoing Patreon patronage would be much appreciated.